Let's look at an important work in the origins of documentary photography, a project called How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rees. Now, Jacob Rees didn't start out as a photographer. He immigrated from Denmark, so he came to the United States as an immigrant. He, and he worked at many different jobs, but he eventually settled into a career as a police reporter in New York, and that's how he came to photography. He came to it as a social reformer who was very well acquainted with the difficulties of, uh, of, of life among the poor and among immigrants in New York City. And he aimed to remedy the problem of the slums where immigrants lived. That was his motivation. So here he is working in New York City of uh, 1888. Um, you can see it's a very different New York City than uh, the way that this neighborhood looks now. In uh, th This neighborhood, by the way, is a, it's a, a part of, of Soho that's some of the most expensive real estate in New York City today. Very different New York in 1888. So at that time, there were parts of the city that the wealthy stayed in, and there were parts of the city that the wealthy never went to. So this is in the rougher, seamy side of New York City. This photograph's called Bandit's Roost. Now, Jacob Reese presented his photographs to the public in the form of a slideshow, which they sometimes would call a magic lantern show. So this is before the years of movies, and people would get together to see slide lectures. It was a form of popular entertainment. So Jacob Reese produced this series of photographs showing what life was like in the immigrant slums of New York City. And he called it How the Other Half Lives because he's showing it to the wealthy people of New York City who would never go to these neighborhoods, which were which would have been dangerous for them to go to. So, uh, so that's that's how this was was structured and how people would have seen it in its time. So the story that he's telling is one of really horrendous living conditions in the tenements, and uh, and the, the squalid conditions in the tenements he identified as the root of the social problem, that, uh, that the, the life in the tenements was really bad and that the buildings themselves were a key part of that social problem and they were a consequence of predatory landlords. So these tenements, these overcrowded, dangerous buildings that people were packed into, extremely overcrowded. They had a lack of ventilation, and as a result, there was dirt and disease there. It was very unhealthy. The construction was unstable. They would have problems with buildings collapsing and, uh, and being uh, fire traps. Um, if a fire started in one of these buildings, which happened all the time, people would be trapped. There would be no way for them to get out. In, this, in these buildings, people were living their lives, and they didn't have water in these buildings, and they didn't have heat in a lot of these buildings. Cooking facilities, people were, were, were just improvising ways to cook their food inside of these tiny crowded little buildings, these tiny rooms in crowded buildings. And they were also doing piecework labor in the living quarters. So all of that is being shown in Jacob Reese's presentation. This is the photograph from How the Other Half Lives that is in our textbook um, called Five Cents a Spot because this was a, a lodging where it was kind of like a proto Airbnb. They were sort of renting out these rooms, not like a hotel. They were just a, just a place for people to be able to come and go for just a very small amount of money and they would pack them in there. Um, so there are all of these laborers in there and the, um, they're, they're sleeping there and, and you know, it's dirty and squalid. Okay, notice about this that were indoors and it's dark. Okay, this room is being illuminated by flash. That's one thing that is new and exciting about what Jacob Reese is doing here. He is the first photographer to figure out how to be to use magnesium flash and take it out into the world. So he's going into these rooms that would have been illuminated by maybe a kerosene lamp. They're very, very dim. But because he's got this flash, he's able to capture all of these images that people would never have been able to get in photographs before. And that's what puts this project into that sort of world of photojournalism because he's capturing people who weren't prepared to be photographed. You 
you can see that in their faces. He's just sort of like barged in. Jacob Reese's working method with these photographs was to go to different uh, different buildings where people spoke various languages. Okay, there would be a Hungarian neighborhood, and there would be a Portuguese neighborhood, and there would be an Irish neighborhood, and you know he would he would go to some building where it was a, a particular ethnicity and, and language. He would have a sort of a, a native guide who would speak the language of the people who work in that building, and he just sort of bust in on them and take their pictures. So you see people who were kind of taken advantage of here. They didn't have the opportunity to sort of present their best face for the camera. So How the Other Half Lives began as a magic lantern show, a lecture show. Magnesium flash was used on these night expeditions into the slums, and then eventually he was able to publish it as a book in 1890. Originally, it was illustrated with prints that were made from drawings that were made from the photographs, and then eventually the technology made it possible to put halftone photographs in there. So later editions were photographically illustrated. So this is what the what Five Cents a Spot would have looked like as a line drawing that was reproduced as an engraving in an early edition of the book in 1890. So in his photographs, you know, he's moving from one building to another, one room to another. Here you can see a family where they've really been able to present their best face to the camera. They're, they're posing, they're looking at the camera, they're, they're looking as good as they can, but you can see that their living conditions are, uh, are really rough. So in this world, in New York City in the 1880s, 1890s, people believed that crime, illiteracy, and moral decay were a consequence of those squalid living conditions. They had these ideas about habits of life. They believed that people's habits were a sign of their character, and they would mutually reinforce the character, that if people had slovenly character, they would have a slovenly home, which would cultivate slovenly habits that made them slovenly people and was cyclical in that way, okay? So to look at these photographs in the way that Jacob Reese is putting them in front of people, he's encouraging a moral judgment. He's sort of evoking these feelings that the tenement residents are a threat to healthy family life because of the habits that they have. So he's 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 not approaching this with a sense of um, of as much empathy as we might think. If you look at the text and how the other half lives, he's he's got a really judgmental tone of voice towards them, and he uses lines like "their sufferings and sins are a just punishment on a community that gave them no other choice." So there's this framing throughout that suggests that they need to be redeemed by the good Christians. And that's where charity was coming from in New York City at this time. They didn't have the kind of social services that we might have associated with the progressive movement that comes along a little bit later. Okay, so these people are heavily dependent upon charity. So that's not, that's not to say they're not working. Um, charity is important, but they're working to the best of their, um, the best of their ability and the best of their opportunity and making opportunities in any way that they can, but they're getting paid so little. And instead of being able to even work in a factory, many of them are getting what they call piece work, which means that they take a bushel of stuff up to their little tenement room and they are sewing collars and they are they're they're knitting socks and they're stitching collars onto shirts and they're making little bits of, of, of cheap jewelry and things like that so these living living spaces are working spaces at the same time which makes them really awful places both to live and to work So a lot of the time um, when uh, Jacob Reese is telling these stories, he focuses on these experiences from the perspective of children because his viewers can be counted on to empathize with children. And the way that he tells the stories focusing on the children's experiences is his way of trying to leverage the empathy of his audience. So there are children of many ages, along with adults, trying to get an education in the hours that they're not working. The children are working a lot of the time, and they don't have, they don't have the schools, they don't have the playgrounds that uh, the children of the wealthy people had. 
There are many photographs in his presentation of children sleeping in corners and alleys, children who are, you, the, when he uses the phrase street Arabs, that just means that they are selling stuff during the day. They're out being peddlers. So they're, they're street peddlers, they're newsies, they're kids who are working um, in, instead of being able to go to school. So these children are dependent on public charity, but he frames them as like little angels. So again, he's connecting with the sense of empathy that he can depend on from his wealthy pay, the, the wealthy attendees of his presentations to be able to feel for the potential for children. But when it comes to telling the stories of the adults, it's a little different. His narrative reinforces racial and ethnic stereotypes to a degree that can be kind of offensive. There are a lot of stories of the deserving and the undeserving. He does not hold back from passing judgment on the people in his stories. There are lots of corrupted men. There are women always at risk of losing their virtue and innocent children who grow up stunted because of the limited opportunities that they have in these dreadful tenements. In a lot of the photographs, he kind of uh, plays on the racial and ethnic stereotypes. And in the book, the chapters are divided down into the different ethnicities and nationalities of the, the people who, um, who live in, uh, in these different neighborhoods. And the photographs do not hesitate from showing people at their worst. Ultimately, his work was successful. He, was, he thought that the landlords could be shamed into changing their practices, and that's not what happened. But he gradually did influence the changing of zoning regulations. Ultimately, laws had to be changed in order to raise public health and safety standards. And it's because of those laws that were changed that buildings had to have fire escapes and were required to have a certain degree of, uh, of access to running water and, uh, and, and, uh, and ventilation in order to be open to uh, be rent rented out to the public.